here we are. I'm Karen Love Basinger, the pastor here at Florence United Methodist Church, and we are delighted to have you with us as we continue to test the waters as safely as we can, returning to in-person worship during this pandemic. And if you're visiting with us today, we pray that this will be a time of deep blessing and that you will feel a profound sense of God's love while you're here in our midst and carry that with you into your week and that you'll feel radical hospitality from us as a faith community committed to following Jesus, which of course does mean that radical hospitality. So here this call to worship. If you're tired, come and worship. And if you're hungry, come and worship. If you're filled with joy, come and worship. And if your spirit already feels renewed, come on and worship. You know, whatever, our God desires our worship, our connection, our ability to say to that which is greater than we are, yeah, we're connecting with you. Whether we have much to give or little to give today, there's healing, the root meaning of salvation, there's salvus, there's healing when we come to worship our God. So for all who are gathered here, for whatever brought you here, come and worship.
nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covered and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, all us to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking Today's Gospel is found in the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Here ends the Gospel. Have you, how many of you 
ever slept through a storm? You've slept through it. All right, a terrifying storm. Well, the closest I ever came, the worst I ever remember is uh, the terrifying storm that was in close proximity it was about 50 years ago when I was living in my first home as an adult in an apartment. And I remember that the head of the bed was, there was a window, and then there was the head of the bed, and this tornado came through. Well, back then, they didn't have such good warning systems. So it came unexpectedly through, and it kind of took the roofs off of some nearby apartment buildings about a mile away. And I remember the wind was so fierce and the rain was so hard that there was water running down under, from under the window, uh, you know, from under the sill. And uh, it was, you know, on the bed, getting on the bed. I didn't sleep through it. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I shared one of my favorite stories with you about uh, the story of Anglican priest John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, and how you know he, he experienced that terrifying storm on his voyage back to England from the colonies, especially Georgia, after he'd made a complete fool out of himself, and he failed miserably in what he had self-avowed as his mission, I'm going to save my soul by saving the Indians. You know, works righteousness. He thought he was going to earn his way into God's loving graces through saving a bunch of Indians, none of which came to Christ under his unspirited preaching. You know, when that's your motivation for preaching, you don't get too far. So he fell in love with, I said Sophie Tucker, but I think that's, that's the wrong era. <laughs> when I told you all the story, I got it corrected. It was Sophie, Sophia Hopke. She was the niece of the chief magistrate there in Georgia, and he courted her for some months, and then maybe he was afraid that that was going to mess with his ministry, so he decided he wouldn't marry her, but darn, you know, just like that, she married somebody else. He was so upset with her, he was just really torn up, and so he took it out on her. So he gets up in the pulpit, and he preaches about her sins and about refusing, and he wouldn't give her communion. He was so mad. Well, her new husband, he took her, took him to court for this, took Wesley to court, and soon other people were filing complaints as well. So in December 1737, he thought he better get out of Dodge. And so, <laughs> so he left for England, and he had with his tail between his legs, so to speak, and he went from bad to worse in his own estimation because, like I told you a couple weeks ago, this big old storm comes up, and he did not sleep through it, but rather he was totally terrified. And all the sailors were crying and begging for their lives. And, you know, he's, what, what shamed him the most was that here he was, you know, this ordained Anglican priest, just tried to earn his salvation, couldn't do it, still didn't feel the healing of God's love. And here's this group of German pietists and Moravians with uh, singing hymns and just acting like there's no big storm going on. And he said, even the women and children. I mean, can you believe that? <laughs> so at this point in his life, our founder, John Wesley, who later, you know, because he couldn't sleep through the storm, he searched and he searched and finally he collapsed into the wide arms of God's grace and mercy, even for him, he said. He, and, you know, from that experience of just giving up the hound of heaven was after him, and he just gave up, and he surrendered to that. And then he was a transformed man with a transformed ministry after what he called that heartwarming experience, when he realized and surrendered to the depth of God's love, even for him. Now, if you look around you right now, you know, many people are in the midst of storms right now. I read one estimate, I started you know, searching online, now, how many people are trying to get help right now? Now just in the self-help peer support groups, about 15 million attend about a half a million support groups weekly. We're stressed. We're in storms. So how can we sleep through the terrifying storms in our lives? How are we, how are we even going to make it through this summer? You know, 
I remember reading an article, I think it was last year, about how depressing it was for the people in Seattle because they always got through the drip, 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 drip by saying, well, summer will come and there'll be August. I think it's August 14th in the past 100 years. There's like, it hasn't rained but just a handful of times. So if you were going to have an outside wedding, that's the day. <laughs> oh, no. Now, what have they got to look forward to in August? What do we all have to look forward to? It's not as bad here on the coast. The smoke, the heat, the storm of nature. It's not always just in water. So how are we going to get through this? Well, what does our text say? Well, we find Jesus at one of his favorite locations, which was the beach. It wasn't it the Oregon coast, but it was the seashore, and it had been a long day. He'd been getting more and more popular, and he'd been healing all these people, and he's provoking strong reactions. I mean, you either liked him or you either loved him or hated him. You know, people he came in contact with. He had his own family members were questioning his mental state. His neighbors, you know, they were giving him a hostile welcome. And the religious professionals and the politicians are always trying to kill him. And the demons fear him. But, you know, the crowds of people that were following him weren't doing that because they wanted to harm him. But they were astonished at the authority of his teaching and his miraculous powers. And then he had this period of sustained teaching and healing. And, and then in the Gospel of Mark, here's this story of Jesus and the storm. And the boat that had served as his platform for teaching, he'd been teaching from the boat because, you know, he was the divine human. And so the human in him got pretty tired. And he needed a getaway vehicle. And so, you know, when he got tired, he was done. He didn't say goodbye. He didn't say, the Lord bless you and keep you. He said, let's get out of here. <laughs> he had reached his limit for the day. He needed some rest. Yeah, the Greek word used for his departure, which was like quick, was abandoned. I mean, he, you know... He knew, like he told us, the poor will always be with you. He knew there would always be so much human need. It's like, okay, I can't give any more today. Got to go refuel, then I'll come back and get at it again. So here he and his disciples, and there's some other boats, they head for the other side of the lake, um, kind of toward, a, according to the biblical witness, an imprecise destination somewhere on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, which is a body of water, a sea that was 13 miles long and seven and a half miles wide. And it, there were all these hills around. There was this cool current of air that would come rushing down from Mount Hermon, 9,200 feet, or other, over other hills and cliffs. And then it could whip the sea into this violent fury pretty quick. And then a small fishing boat would be in danger of sinking. So here he is asleep. And we are talking asleep. He was comfy sleep. He was really resting. And the storm blows up. Now you'd think, you know, with all these professional fishermen on board, that, he, that they could have handled it. They didn't need the assistance of a carpenter. But, you know, unlike the details that are provided in the Old Testament story of Jonah and the whale, giving account of the terrible storm through which Jonah also uh, slept, Mark doesn't tell us what they did to try to save the boat, but believing the boat is about to sink, taking all of them with him, with it, they perceive this sleeping Jesus as being indifferent to the peril of the raging storm and the fragile boat. So they wake him up. He gets up. And he rebukes the wind and sea. The Greek word used by Mark is muzzled. It's one of the meanings of it, muzzled. He didn't permanently quiet it. It's just like a dog barking or something if you were going to muzzle an aggressive dog. They were still terrified after that, but it wasn't because of the sea that had calmed down. It's like, who is this guy? Who is this guy? 
Wow. I mean, uh, you know, in, in Mark, he was kind of presenting him as kind of a teacher type. You know, Matthew, he, he was talking about the Son of God and all that. Well, not so much Mark, the first gospel. It was more like they hadn't gotten there yet. So they were shocked that this guy could have that kind of power over nature when it was upset. And then, you know, that's a really powerful, all kinds of associations that come up in the Old Testament. You know, the raging waters are an important image. The power to control the seas and subdue the storms belongs to God. Psalm 89, Psalm 93, controlling the seas also makes you think of the, the actions of God in the Exodus when the seas were parted, when Moses cleared the way in the Exodus. And then storms could also be used as a metaphor for evil forces around the world, evil forces from which only God can save, Psalm 69. And then throughout the Old Testament, sleep is an important image. If you've got the gift of being able to sleep untroubled and peacefully, that's a sign that you're trusting in God's power. And there's another aspect of that, if you dig deeper into the, uh, the scholarship. In the Middle East, the sleep was something that was a gift uh, that you would see in God. In other words, if, I mean, I think, I think back to Juneteenth. I'm sorry, my mind just kind of associates this, that, and the other. I think back to the slaves, to the African-American people when they were slaves, and the lack of power they had, or that lack of agency in their own lives to sleep when they wanted to, to rest when they wanted to, to take a holiday when they wanted to. Well, this was associated with the divine back then. It was the divine who can rest untroubled and peacefully. And so there was a lot going on. When you read this simple story in the scripture, there's a lot of layers of associations that the listeners at the time would be piecing together. Oh, wow, you know, seeing the connections. So Jesus had faith in God's power to keep him safe and, and the disciples safe. But it was in the ultimate sense, I think. Not that stuff doesn't happen. All kinds of bad things and evil things happen in life. But they were panicked because they didn't have faith. Their faith was different from his untroubled faith that they mistook it for careless indifference, like he doesn't care. And isn't that something we cry out to God when we're suffering with things that happen? And we say, God, don't you care? You know, how could a loving God allow this? And that's not a, a question that's answered in this passage. And you know, it's a story of a miracle, but the miracle only happens after they accuse him of being indifferent. He's like, well, okay. Y'all stop it. <laughs> and so, do you not care? Don't you care? And he wakes up and he rebukes the wind. He calms the seas. He muzzles nature. And when he does this, it was the same uh, vocabulary that's used like in uh, Mark 1, 21 to 28, literally be muzzled. And like the evil spirits, the wind and the sea obey. He muzzles the hostile powers of wind and sea and makes them powerless to harm the disciples with the authority of God. But, you know, this is a story of a miracle, but that's not the key takeaway as wonderful as that is, that's not the key takeaway. It's the key takeaway is about identity. Because he says, the climax of this passage is when he asked the disciples, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Do you not, literally, do you not yet have faith? I mean, what have I got to do? Die on the cross? 
come from back from the dead? What have I got to do around here? He's been healing the sick. He's been practicing outrageous and radical hospitality. Who he's hanging out with and who he's extending love and grace to. And you don't have faith yet when I, about what I'm telling you about God. You know, it's like, what's the problem with you people? So at the core of the story, it's an issue of trust. Now, there's an unconditional, unconditional, unorthodox Christian teaching called A Course in Miracles. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it or read it, but Course um, has a little teacher's manual that goes with the three volumes set, and it, and it talks about how the whole journey is about the development of trust. Think about it. Your whole life is about learning to trust. And some of us got off to a pretty shaky start. If, we're, if we can even get over it, some people in our world, because they weren't in a safe environment or able to form those attachments or those bonds of love and trust. But uh, even in the best of circumstances, the healthiest family of origin, it's a lifelong journey to develop trust. And a lot of that has to do with understanding that what I think, you know, like one of the first lessons in Course in Miracles is you're never upset for the reason you think. What I think is going on is not what's really going on, you know, and learning to say, okay, voice for God, inner Christ, show me how to look at this. Show me what this is really about. And it's always about love. It's like course is. It's either love that you're experiencing as you interact with somebody, or it's a cry for love, a cry for help. We heard about people crying for help in our prayers. We cry for help. Anytime we're not acting loving, it's always either love that you're experiencing or a cry for love. So the development of trust, to be able to see the reality with the big R behind all the little realities of our senses, of being a human, of being in these bodies, of being told by culture who we are, what we are, what's going on. What does God say? So, what could this mean for us today? Anybody ever heard, are we there yet? <laughs> Any of your parents ever? <laughs> are we there yet? Uh, did you ever say that? Are we there yet? You ever feel that when you're on a trip, a long car trip? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's a close variation of what Jesus was saying. It's like, why aren't you there yet? After all I've been trying to show you and teach you, the there is, why don't you have faith yet? Why are you still so scared? Like, do you think you're just a body? Do you think this is all there is? Do you think that just because you're terrified that that's the ultimate reality? You know, like you can be, sh you know, you can be shaking in your boots and really scared, but you know you're not your feelings. So why is it, he's saying, after all that road tripping we've done, you've been all over this place with me, why do you still have zero faith? And maybe, maybe we don't get there because, like John Wesley, we haven't made that movement from our head, our intellectual understanding of the faith, to our heart, to having that heartwarming experience from knowing about God. Let me tell you my theories about God to knowing God. What's the difference if I say, I can tell you all about Kathy and I can list off all these demographics and this and that, even her astrological sign. But how is that different? from knowing Kathy. 
the love that she is, that energy, that's a world of difference. So we still have that distance. What do they say? The longest journey in the world is from that many inches from the head to the heart. You know, that distance from the intellectual ascent, from the agreement, from the theories, from the doctrines. Yeah, 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 that sounds like a good idea. That sounds like a God I can, you know, stand up behind. Okay, and then we arrive at that place where we've had an experience and we can't argue with it because it changes us forever. We can't prove it, but we're living it. I know I, my life was totally changed. I've shared this before when I was in a share group as a young adult, and I agreed to act as if. Okay, for 12 weeks, I'm going to act as if there's a God. I'm going to act as if prayer makes a difference. I'm not going to question. I'm just going to pretend, kind of like they say in the 12-step movement. Fake it till you make it. I've never looked back. Because when I acted as if, when I opened my heart, I had it, there was something there, something that was relating to me. So how do we get to a place of utter faith and confidence in God? Does it mean we won't be terrified? No. You're in a body. Your body's firing and wired. You know, it's all wired and fired. And, no. We'll be scared. But John Wesley taught us that as Methodists, as the people call Methodists, we get to that faith through showing up and showing up and showing up, practicing the means of grace, prayer, meditation, worship, the sacraments, studying the Bible. He calls it, you know, working out our own salvation, not buying into a set of, I believe, these ten things, but having an experience through showing up. And then... You can't make it happen. You can't predict when it's going to happen. It may not happen, but by God's grace, it will happen. You'll get it. You'll get that thunderbolt or that gentle flame, and you'll have the heartwarming experience for yourself. So how do we move then from doing what these, these means of grace are called practicing the presence? How do we move from that to feeling the calm in the storm. It's through that development of trust, of knowing that, okay, whatever storm is raging around me, be it smoke, be it coronavirus, be it whatever, nothing, the Course in Miracles says, nothing real can be threatened. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Therein lies the peace of God. Therein lies the peace of God. Thanks be to God. sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore very deeply stained within seeking to rise no more but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters lifted me now safe am I love lifted me Love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. 
something happens, they are to come into action right away. Well, this hole came right down into the, the boat, and water was coming in like you wouldn't believe. Well, they got mattresses and put them on the grating on the floor, and put the grating up into the hole, and then four by fours underneath that, and they slowed the water coming in, and up to where we could blow our uh, ballast tanks and get back to the surface. And we got back to the surface and dried everything out. Not a soul was lost. Mm -hmm. And while we were down there and everybody was uh, uh, shaken and afraid, our, uh, well, we didn't have a preacher on board. But chaplain. We had, our <laughs> chaplain mm -hmm. said, everybody pray. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure everybody was praying. I know I was. Mm -hmm. But we got back to the surface, got everything all dried out and everything. We didn't lose a man. And neither did the destroyer. But that just, like she said, things can happen you don't expect. You have faith in God, everything turns out okay. And Rosie's been down on my boat with me. We had a dependence day, and she went out with me on the boat, and she, she got to steer the boat. She got to run the down and stern planes and everything, and uh, got to do about everything I had done. But uh, I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Butch, what, what that reminds me of is a story I heard. I, I assume it's true, but uh, back some years ago, there was a, a, 
I think it was in India, the, the chemical factory, and um, the alarms went off. It's, you know, it's terrible sound of all these alarms going off, and so people start rushing out of the building. But somebody was really attuned, listened to an inner voice, the inner Christ, or whatever you want to call it, and uh, got under the desk, turned the fan on, went to sleep. That's what they were told to do. Get under the desk, turn the fan on. You know, put, take the fan with you, turn it on you, get under the desk, go to sleep. And that person survived, and many died. But, you know, they lowered the respiration. They didn't run out into the fumes, you know. So I think that's, you know, in the storms, we have to listen to that voice, that still, quiet voice for God, and ask, what do I do now? Yeah, so I'm glad your story had a wonderful ending. Let's receive this blessing along with the gems of other blessings that we get every moment we're taking a breath. May the God of all hope open your eyes. May the God of all peace still your anxious mind. May the God of all love fill your heart to fullness beyond measure. And now go in the hope and the peace and the love of God. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.